Hello, biology people. This is Cynthia Coulthard again from Hamilton International Middle School. And today we are going to talk about how your genes give you your physical traits or how your genotype gives you your phenotype. This leads directly off of Mr. Kowalki's lesson last time on how your DNA forms your proteins, which give you all of your physical traits. So let's go ahead and get started. A reminder to please work at your own pace. If you need to review this slide, go ahead and pause now and review it and then continue on. So as I said earlier, we are gonna be talking about how your genotype, your genotype becomes your phenotype. And after viewing this PowerPoint and viewing this lesson, you should be able to define and discuss the terms allele genotype, and phenotype. You should also be able to describe how your genotype determines your phenotype using the term allele. And then you're also going to model how your genotype determines your phenotype using a bioflowers example. It's a fake flower. A fake flower, which I'll walk you through in the next video. So first things first, let's go ahead and pull out our vocab sheets. And we're going to make some notes in the next section where it says add in gene regulation lesson 2.4. What is an allele and to label the alleles below. So a quick reminder that a gene is a piece of DNA or a section of a chromosome that tells an organism how to make a specific protein. It's like a recipe. It tells your cell how to make a protein. And each and every single protein in your body has a gene that codes for it. So for example, what you have here highlighted is a gene that codes for kind of like a Pac-Man protein. And the version one of the gene contains the A's, G's, C's, T's that you see below that we learned make up DNA. Those are the nucleotides, the nucleotide monomers that make up the polymer DNA. Now this version of the gene happens to be labeled functional, so it can do the job that it was designed to do. But say we look at another version of a gene. One change, you will see that that nucleotide A was changed to a C, and then the complementary base pair then, instead of a T, is a G. That one little change can actually change the entire shape of the protein making it non-functional. So remember that a gene is a piece of chromosome or a small part of a chromosome that tells your cell how to make a protein. And the specific A's, C's, G's, and T's, like you learned about last time with the Fruit Loops, determine which amino acids make up the protein. Remember that amino acids are the monomer of the polymer protein, which determines the protein shape. Now, we call different versions of the same gene, the gene that codes for a specific protein, an allele. And these different versions can have slightly different nucleotide sequences. Now, not all different nucleotide sequences are going to dramatically change the shape of the protein, but some of them can make them non-functional, as you see here. So in this case, our Pac-Man allele or sorry, our Pac-Man protein, when it is coded for by the first allele, is a functional protein because the amino acids that are coded for by those A's, C's, G's, and T's form a protein that has a uh, shape that can do its job, or the active site can do its job. But this one little change in the second allele, or allele two, can actually cause the protein to not be able to do its job because it changes the active site of that protein. So the example that we're going to be working through in this unit uh, is about bioflowers. Now bioflowers aren't a, a real flower. It's just an example that we use, a model that we use to help explain a relatively complex uh, subject. So we're gonna be talking about bioflowers that can be white, blue, or red. So bioflowers in this example have two alleles 
for an enzyme that converts a blue pigment into a red pigment. So the little Pac-Man protein that you saw earlier converts blue pigments into red pigments. And these flowers have two alleles for that enzyme. One of the alleles codes for a functional protein, which can take that blue pigment and make it red. And one of the alleles codes for a non-functional protein, which cannot change that blue pigment into a red pigment. One thing for you to know is both of the alleles are expressed. So both of the genes for this specific protein are expressed in a cell, just like all of the others. So the flower color gene that we have demonstrated on the two chromosomes below, we have a blue allele of the flower color and a red allele of the flower color. And remember that you're getting one from your first parent and one from your second parent. So in our first example, let's look at what happens when a bioflower has two types or has two um, of the functional alleles. So two alleles that code for the functional protein. Well, in that case, you can see here, mom has the gene for the functional protein and dad has the gene for the functional protein. Remember, both of those genes are used, meaning the proteins from those genes are being made. And if we look at what happens, we can see that both of those genes produce proteins that can functionally turn blue pigments into red pigments. So what color do you think this flower would be? It would be red. Now, what if one of the parents gave, or one of the parents had a version of the gene that produced functional proteins, and one of the parents gave this flower a gene that produced non-functional pigments? Remember that both of these alleles are expressed, so the gene that codes for the functional protein would make functional proteins, and the gene that codes for the non-functional proteins would be making non-functional proteins. But guess what? Functional proteins are being made, so what color would this flower be? Yep, it's going to be red, because those functional proteins, even though there aren't as many as the previous example, are enough to convert all of the blue pigments into red. So this flower is red. Now what if both parents gave this flower genes that coded for non-functional proteins? So the gene from parent A codes for a non-functional protein. The genes for parent B codes for a non-functional protein. Remember, both of those genes are being used, meaning proteins are being made from both of those genes, but they both code for the non-functional protein, so only non-functional proteins are being made. So what color is this flower? It is blue. Still pretty, but blue. So if we look at this overall, we can see how the chromosome combinations give us information about the allele combinations and then the observable characteristic or the trait. So how your chromosomes determine your traits. In the first example, we have two functional alleles. Remember, both are expressed, so both make proteins, so they're making two sets of functional proteins, converting that blue pigment into a red pigment, and you get red flowers. Now in the second, exa second example, excuse me, we have a chromosome that contains the gene for the functional protein and a chromosome that contains the gene for the non-functional protein. Remember, these are still coding for the same protein. It's a protein that converts color molecules but one is functional and one is non-functional, but they're both expressed. And because there are some functional proteins being expressed, the bioflower can convert those blue pigments into red pigments, and you end up with a red flower. Now in this third example, both of the chromosomes contain the allele for the non-functional protein. So only non-functional proteins are being made, and none of those red pigments, I'm sorry, none of those blue pigments 
can be converted into red pigments. So you end up with a blue flower. So these combinations of alleles determine your physical characteristics and your observable characteristics. Remember that you get one set of all of your chromosomes from uh, each parent. So one set from one parent and one set from another parent. So you have two sets of all of your genes for the most part. And so in this case, these bioflowers have two sets of a gene that codes for a protein that converts blue pigment into red pigment. And those two versions of the genes or two alleles are called the genotype. And the phenotype is the observable trait. So the phenotype is the observed or measurable trait of an organism, organism that relates to one gene. And the genotype are the two alleles that an organism has for that trait or the combination of alleles. So the example that we're working with right now, the trait is flower color. The phenotype or the physical trait is red or blue. And the genotype is the genes, the alleles, functional, 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 non-functional, non-functional, non-functional. Those are the two genes or the two alleles that uh, the flower has. Now these words are very similar. And one of the ways that I use to remember which is which is the genotype is based on your genes and the phenotype is your physical trait. So GG and PP. It helps me. It may help you. So in the example that we've been working through, the genotype of these flowers are the proteins that are being, or the genes that are making the proteins. So in the first example, we have functional and functional, second functional and non-functional, third non-functional and functional. And the phenotype is the actual color that you see. So again, genotype is based on the genes Phenotype is based on the physical trait. Remember that information flows from your DNA through the process of making proteins to your traits. And we have many, many, many traits within us that make us these unique individuals that we are. And it's all coded for in our DNA through the process of making proteins. So your DNA that's your genotype and your traits, the physical stuff that we see and sometimes don't see like um, what we were or you'll be talking about in a little bit, um, diseases that you can't see. Uh, that's your phenotype. Your genotype determines your phenotype. So your genes determine your traits. And if you worked through the spirit bear examples, you'll see that a different genotype can lead to a different protein structure, which gives a completely different phenotype, just like we saw with the bioflowers. So there's a practice assignment that you're welcome to do. It's a genotype to phenotype worksheet, and you're going to use this DNA wheel that you used with Mr. Kowalki to determine what amino acid sequence your protein will be. And I'll walk you through it again a little bit when we do our next video on the um, bioflower worksheet. So again, take a second, make sure you understand what an allele, genotype, and phenotype are. See if you can explain to someone else how your genotype determines your phenotype, making sure you use the word allele. And then next up, you're going to model how your genotype determines your phenotype using a bioflowers worksheet. So coming up next, you're going to check your work on the genotype to phenotype worksheet using the key that is going to be provided. Consider completing the optional student questions to deepen your understanding. Ask your teacher if they would like you to do these. Make an entry into your learning tracking tool entitled genotype to phenotype and then if your teacher has added a discussion board to their Schoology page make sure that you add to that discussion and if you have any questions at all please make sure to reach out to your teacher 
Coming up next is the video that I will be making on the genotype to phenotype worksheet. And then after that, you're going to zoom into sickle cell with Ms. McGinty. I hope you have a wonderful day today.